Good afternoon. On today's Angry Alien Bulletin, many UFO enthusiasts try to find a pattern in the various vehicles that have been spotted not only on Earth but throughout the solar system. And the one shape that tends to come up over and over again is either a cigar-shaped object or perhaps something that might look like a saucer viewed on edge. And this long, slender shape has appeared not only in our skies, but also in orbit around Mars, or even traveling through the solar system. The only interstellar object ever detected traveling through our solar system that wasn't a comet anyway, was an object that bears a great deal of similarity to either the cigar-shaped or disc-shaped craft that we tend to see here on our planet. The question is, why do we see the same configuration over and over again? Is it because that a certain civilization just has quite a few craft that fit that description? It's just their general design? Or is it something else? Well, we're going to talk about an alternative, another theory today that makes all of the rest of these theories seem very ordinary by comparison. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon. Once again, welcome to our latest Angry Alien Bulletin. By the way, this topic was suggested by one of our Patreon supporters. I oftentimes listen to the suggestions made by my Patreon folks and indeed folks who support me in any way. So if you're interested in contributing to the content on this channel, well, joining that group is not a bad thing to do and you can do that for as little as $3 a month. But we'll stop talking talking about that and let's go ahead and discuss what's called a Van Neumann probe. But actually there are other people who have had ideas of how alien civilizations might explore the galaxy besides Van Neumann for those of you who are familiar with his work. But the first actual work in regards to an alien probe or alien exploration of the galaxy came from a professor Bracewell at Stanford University. Now, first of all, he tried to calculate what would be the most effective way that an advanced civilization might explore. And then he made some calculations. For example, if the galaxy is heavily populated with extraterrestrial civilizations, in other words, only about 10 light years separating each, then communicating via radio waves makes sense. However, if the galaxy is only thinly populated with a thousand light years distance separating civilizations, which is not beyond the realm of possibility, then communication is virtually impossible because of the immense time lag and acquisition difficulties. But if the Milky Way is populated at some sort of intermediate level, say a hundred light years between stars, then the best way to explore and to contact other races is not by radio signals, but rather by an automated messenger probe. So the classic Bracewell probe contact scenario involves an automated device entering our solar system, detecting radio emissions of an unnatural character coming from us or any other advanced civilization, and it positions itself in some convenient parking orbit above our planet. And upon receiving some human transmission, an arbitrary transmission doesn't really matter what, an intelligent probe beams an identical copy of the message back to the transmitter in hopes of gaining our attention. Once accomplished, then language lessons soon follow and hopefully meaningful discourse and cultural exchange between humanity and the automated alien ambassador ultimately takes place. And interestingly enough, something like this has been happening on a pretty regular basis for some time. 
Let's say, for example, that you're driving down the road in the middle of winter listening to a song that ends thusly, I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing you. And after that, there's a silence indicating that the song is done, but the silence lasts only just a beat, punctuated only by the tires rolling over the powder of snow. Then the end of the song plays again and fills the car with the familiar timbre of that same voice, I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing you a repetition of the song's last line, exactly as you'd heard it just moments ago, according to some, isn't just a delay or a funny fault in the radio transmission. This is instead deliberate reception, amplification, and return of our own signals. And interestingly enough, in spite of all of the decades that our radio experts have been trying to determine exactly what causes this bizarre phenomena, we haven't come up with a solid and convincing answer. But Professor Bracewell of Stanford felt that repeating our own radio broadcast back to us could be an indication of alien life attempting to communicate. Playing back a part of a broadcast will not only attract attention, but will ensure that someone is listening when this occurs. And it's a simple enough process, but it can also reveal a lot of information about the equipment we have available here on Earth. Turning the volume of the repeated signal up or down can give away the sensitivity of our technology. How fast we're able to record or reply to signals will be important for the alien technology to determine an acceptable rate at which to send us our information and the time between transmissions can reveal the schedule of life down here on Earth. But what does all of this have to do with our observing cigar-shaped or disc-shaped craft all over the solar system? Well, a John von Neumann, who was a Hungarian-American mathematician and physicist, took the Bracewell probe to the next level. He thought that in order for these types of probes to cover the galaxy in the most efficient way, they would have to have the capability of reproducing themselves, a self reproducing probe capable of churning out exact copies of itself, or maybe not necessarily exact copies, but similar copies, each one suited to a specific mission or design. And so you need to have what is essentially an assembler robot and an analyzer with this design. And the reason you need these two components, you need the assembler to build additional robots, but you also need an analyzer to look for the appropriate in situ materials that you're going to need in order to manufacture new robots, new duplicates of the original design. And incidentally, in an article entitled A Self-Reproducing Interstellar Probe, which I've been quoting frequently from during the course of this video by Robert Freitas Jr., he actually comes up with an idea of how we could actually build a probe to fit these specifications. The spacecraft is called Repro and it utilizes the Project Daedalus fusion power design in order to get the spacecraft into another star system. And as you can see, it utilizes a powerful first stage in order to propel a much heavier payload than Daedalus was originally intended to carry so that you can not only get to the other star system but also decelerate and have enough equipment or have enough materials on board in order to start manufacturing a new Adidas spacecraft and a propulsion stage, by the way, once you arrive at your target solar system. So one of the most demanding material requirements once this spacecraft reaches its target solar system is to find enough helium-3 and deuterium in order to produce enough fusion propellant for another spacecraft. Now, the best place to acquire this sort of thing would be from a Jovian world like Jupiter or Saturn. And incidentally, we have spotted a cylindrical craft near the rings of Saturn in the course of our photographing the solar system. Again, no real explanation as to what these objects might have been that we saw during this investigation of the Saturnian system. By the way, what you're looking at right now is an object that was detected in Mars orbit. This is not the Saturnian photograph. I'll show you that a little bit later on, but nevertheless, we keep seeing 
seeing the same pattern over and over again in the solar system, suggesting that maybe we might have more than one of these objects exploring and perhaps acquiring the necessary materials to build another mothership to travel to yet another solar system. Now, another possible source of propellant aside from Jovian planets would be a long period comet or perhaps a number of these comets. Keep in mind, you don't need to have the primary ship rendezvous with whatever the source of the propellant might be. Instead, it could send out numerous probes to search for the necessary in situ resources Resources. And there are quite a number of comets, both in the inner cloud and the Oort cloud. Just the inner cloud has an estimated 3 million comets available, and those would definitely be necessary to produce the required propellant. However, probably the best strategy would be to extract the fuel from a Jovian world and then extract all the necessary metallic components, rare earths, etc., that you require from. From Jovian moons at the same time and the whole strategy is laid out in this article it's quite interesting the idea is to set down a small factory called a seed factory on the surface of one of these moons that factory in turn sends out probes which gathers the necessary raw materials to eventually produce a self-replicating factory by the way the original probe carries 20 tons of repair shops and spare parts in case there are any breakdowns or mistakes during the assembly process and eventually we have a very large factory we're talking 346 million kilograms in size in order to produce all the necessary raw material to build not only a new spacecraft but also the propulsion stage of that spacecraft this is a very ambitious plan and one that would quite possibly produce some extremely visible impacts on the Jovian moons should this be the place where aliens decide to set up their reproduction and mining facilities. Up to this point, we really haven't kept a close enough view of all of the Jovian moons to see if any craters were to suddenly appear. So we're talking about a large mothership, perhaps smaller ships designed to see out in situ materials necessary to produce more motherships and also smaller probes to find the in situ resources on the planets in question and also of course to explore the entire solar system in detail. Have we seen evidence of this? Well, yeah, quite possibly. The object that was apparently in orbit around Mars might have been very large, several kilometers in length at least. And then, of course, we have smaller cigar-shaped objects that we've seen perhaps even in orbit around our own planet. And then, of course, we have these very small spherical objects that the Pentagon has admitted are being spotted all over the planet. Those could be smaller probes utilizing an electromagnetic propulsion system that I've described in previous episodes designed to look for signs of life, signs of advanced civilizations, or more perhaps in situ resources that their ship could make use of. Although I find it highly unlikely that an alien probe would find Earth to be a really good source of resources simply because, yes, there is helium-3 here, but not not very much and yes there are the raw materials necessary to produce a spacecraft but you would have lots of interference from the civilization that's already here and all of that would be unnecessary interference given the fact that there's plenty of resources in the asteroid belt in comets and in the Jovian moons and in the Jovian planets themselves that a spacecraft like this could make use of in order to produce duplicates of itself by the way this would be a a very long process. We're talking centuries in order for the chemical robots, the aerostats, which are essentially giant balloon factories harvesting the helium-3 from the Jovian worlds, the miners, the metallurgist robots, all of these fabrication systems and assemblers, 
lots of different types of spacecraft actually necessary to produce replicas of itself. But consider the efficiency and the effectiveness of this kind of probe as opposed to building these things one at a time and sending them out to different solar systems throughout the galaxy. Even if you had enormous resources at your disposal, the estimated cost for a Daedalus spacecraft is in excess of a trillion dollars. But even if the repro was 10 times that expense, it would still be cost effective to do it that way because a self-replicating spacecraft would ultimately be able to explore hundreds if not thousands of star systems for perhaps 10 times the cost of the original Daedalus, which would be extremely cost effective in the long run. Interstellar spacecraft, at least that are able to carry very large payloads, are doubtlessly going to be immensely expensive, even for advanced civilizations. And so therefore, this kind of self-replicating strategy is perhaps the best or only way that an advanced civilization is going to be able to effectively explore the galaxy and make contact with its inhabitants. And given that we can already foresee a way to do this with our own technology currently, imagine what an extremely advanced civilization thousands of years or perhaps even millions of years more advanced than our own might be able to do with their version of Van Neumann probe with perhaps nano machines reproducing the new material out of the raw in situ materials without any manufacturing facility being required at all. The possibilities are endless, but what we are observing right now, I think, could be a clue as to what we should really be looking for in our own solar system for evidence of current extraterrestrial activity. Perhaps examining the Jovian moons for mysteriously appearing craters that don't actually look like craters. Any evidence for activity on any extraterrestrial body that shouldn't be there. And currently, we're really not trying all that hard to do that. We may notice a new crater on Mars, for example, but we don't really examine these craters to see whether or not they might really be just craters or they might be something else. And until the scientific community seriously considers the possibility that we are not alone and that those trying to contact us might already be here in an automated form, but nevertheless already here, we're never going to find out. And that's something that needs to change soon if we're ever going to find out what's really going on. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and also please consider supporting this channel on patreon and for those of you who are patreon members please make sure to continue to put your video ideas in the various threads that i've provided on the patreon site i am eager to produce more videos like this thanks again for watching and as always stay angry about space